today's webinar on five key areas to standardize, start and grow a business analysis community of practice brought to you by IAVA's corporate program. IAVA is a nonprofit professional association serving the growing field of business analysis. As the global thought leader and voice of the business analysis community, IIBA actively supports the recognition of the profession and works to maintain global standards for the ongoing development of the practice and certifications. IIBA's uh, global corporate program provides the support and resources organizations need to build business analysis capabilities and drive professional development and growth. And these are some of our uh, corporate members um, that you see on your screen um, today. professionals through IAVA's global chapter network to helping corporate program members roll out capabilities with the support of IAVA endorsed education providers and so much more. Together we advance the profession and practice of business analysis around the globe. It's not new thinking that business analysis is a critical component to the success of any project or program. But how business analysis is conducted is equally important to help navigate the complexities of a project, which can benefit from standardizing, from standard, standardizing um, five years. Today, we, begin, we will begin by looking at the difference between a community of practice versus center of excellence, then dive into the five key areas every business analysis team lead or manager can start to standardize to optimize their team's productivity. We'll start with project methodology, tools and templates, learning and, uh, learning and professional development, peer reviews, and then um, we will dive into the Q&A portion of our session. So if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them in the Q&A box and we will answer questions at the end of our session during the Q&A portion of, of the webinar. So without further ado, I'd like to begin by introducing our panelists. Welcome Scott Bennett, Manager uh, of Business Analysis at IBA, Deb Mason, Manager of Business Analysis at Best Buy, Daniel Robert, Manager of Business Systems Analysis at Canadian Red Cross. Hello, everyone. Um, please Scott, I'll start with you. Hi, my name is Scott Bennett. I'm the manager of business analysis at IIBA. Um, I have experience standing up and running a center of excellence in a previous role where I worked at a subsidiary of Sun Life. So excited to be part of the conversation today. Over to you, Deb. Hi, uh, my name is Deb Mason. I am the BA manager at Best Buy Canada, and I have had um, the privilege of working at companies that have COPs. And I'm very happy to be here today. What are you, Danielle? Hi everyone, my name is Danielle Robert and I manage the business systems analysis section of the Center of Excellence at the Red Cross. Great, well, the conversation we're gonna to have today, um, I hope uh, you'll find interesting. Um, all of us are managers of business analysts um, and that's really the focus is to help people where you've got disciplines and increase the capacity of your team and the productivity of your, of your team. The first thing I want to cover off um, is about a community of practice versus a center of excellence. Some people might not know the differentiation between the two and, and it's a little bit murky between the two, but I put together this slide to illustrate that a little bit. Um, a community of practice is something that's more of an informal grouping um, of people coming together and learning about best practices from each other. Whereas a center of excellence is typically put together by managers and leaders um, it's formal in the structure um, and focuses on standards and best practices. Um, the purpose of the center of excellence really is to drive consistency and efficiency. Um, and you might find it more in large organizations than smaller ones. Um, and I know um, Deb and Danielle have had uh, different experiences with COPs, COEs. Um, Deb, I think you have a community of practice in your area, right? Yes, we do. Uh, yeah, we have a BA community of uh, practice. Um, and uh, we also have some COEs here where there's a lot of community of practices and um, multiple community of practices under one COE umbrella. 
Yeah. And Danielle, you have a center of excellence. Is that right? Yes. I'm part of the center of excellence at the Red Cross, along with um, QA and Deb, who are also part of the center of excellence. Okay, great. So I just wanted to give uh, the audience a flavor that there are these different setups. There isn't one that's right or wrong. And as Deb shared, both exist in her organization. Um, so I just wanted to set a bit of context there so you knew what we're talking about today. I'm going to pass it over now to um, Deb, who's going to cover off the first slide. Thanks, Scott. Um, yeah, it's a very much an honor to be here today. I'm uh, no expert, but I've had the good fortune of working at places over the last 10 years uh, where there's been a community of practice. Um, I appreciate that not everyone has one, and, and so I'm happy to share my experiences today. Uh, the first thing I would say is if you're thinking of creating a COP is to know your culture. Um, my experience um, at UBC uh, where I worked for seven years, um, they have, uh, um, they're an academic uh, environment, um, it's hierarchical, and Best Buy in comparison is retail and it's self-organized teams, so very different cultures. Um, and the culture shapes the COP. Mm -hmm. So I would ask, you know, your, ask yourself, um, what methodology do you follow in your culture? Um, Sema is going to run a pulse check, um, which you can vote on, um, and the, she will be asking uh, the group here today whether you're waterfall or agile or a hybrid agile kind of environment so that we can get a feel for your culture. So when I think of waterfall, I think of uh, a software development lifecycle kind of framework where there's planning and requirements analysis and some sort of construction piece and uh, testing, release, implementation, going through that, that framework. Um, it's typically document heavy um, with project plans and requirements, um, gathering process flows, uh, just, you know, all of those things, building together uh, use cases and whatnot to create, to culminate in a big bang. Um, release. And um, if we take a peek into requirements in particular, uh, the skills and the template and uh, templates and the standards um, must that are needed to support a COP are like um, the deep research and the requirements gathering, um, the writing of those requirements, refining them, um, having, a, if there's so many of them, having a tool to manage them, uh, JAMA or whatnot. <laughs> and um, you know, grouping your requirements by capability sets for the different areas of that particular system, and then business audits and prioritizations uh, of the requirements, and uh, for for the whole initiative. So the scope is quite large, um, and it's uh, culminating in a big bang kind of release. Um, in contrast, uh, Agile is delivering the minimum viable product or the MVP in a two week increment. And I think of, an, of a scrum framework where there's a team and there's a backlog that the product owner has created. Uh, and you go through a, a spin of, an, in that two week of sprint planning um, to pull the stories in, um, daily standups or scrum to see where people are at, what they're working on, any blockers they might have. Uh, and as well as um, backlog rooming mid middle of the, that two week sprint to think about what we might bring in the next time. And then a sprint review with the business to assess if we got it right. <laughs> and then um, a retro uh, to uh, find out how we can make things better the next time where we miss the mark um, with the team providing inputs. And the BA skills and the templates and the standards in that scenario uh, need to support an iterative, iterative and incremental um, approach. And the documentation in contrast is actually quite light. And the focus is on for the, uh, before we even bring anything into to the sprint, we'll often do like a discovery. Uh, and the focus is specifically on the epics that the PM has set out um, in the ready backlog. Uh, which is kind of like a flashlight of what is in scope for the next, say, three to six sprints. 
um, things are will be more be a bit more groomed. Um, and uh, the purpose is for the BAs to engage with the business um, on uh, pain points, um, current state flows, requirements, but um, specific to that sprint. So um, the uh, the acceptance criteria and the minimum viable product and the story points and the future state vision are all kind of a team sport. Those things are, are, are done collectively with the PM and very potentially a UXD involved on that future state vision piece, working collaboratively as a team. Um, the requirements are quite lean. Um, they're for that epic only. Um, they're not end to end. Um, the, we often work in, in Miro instead of Visio because it the business can easily get in there. It's very interactive. Everybody can draw the flow, <laughs> um, comment on it. Um, and uh, we uh, will put our stories, uh, when the stories are pulled in, they're groomed and pulled in and the BAs will put their tasks underneath that they're gonna work on in that sprint to support the delivery. So a much later form of documentation. Um, so the contrast between the two is that uh, the scope for the requirements is full set and waterfall and MVP um, and acceptance criteria on the Epic only for that, for that product feature that we're delivering in Agile. And the delivery approach is big bang on waterfall and it's incremental in the Agile world. And the, um, the teams, like the discovery sessions are a little bit, um, are still something that I think is uh, even though it's um, even though that we're in a world where it's work from home, I find that the best advantage, no matter whether you're waterfall or agile, is that we have an opportunity through teams to like get permission to run through their process, and we can look at um, the systems that the business is using, and we can easily get you know I work in a wiki and I grab screen grabs and I dump it in my wiki and I put notes on the steps that, of the process and and continuously wash and repeat that. Um, instead of peeking over their shoulder beside their deck going, can I have a screenshot of that? <laughs> or can I have access to the system? Because I, you know, I, I, I want to go in and play around with it and try to remember desperately what they showed me in that one hour meeting that I had with them. So either way, I think the work from home is kind of a blessing in disguise in that space. Um, I'm thinking right at this point now, I'm going to pass it over to my, my friend, Diane, Danielle, who's going to talk a little bit about some of those best practices. And a COP. Oh, and Danielle, you're on mute. Of course I am. Raise of the year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hi, everyone. I'm going to answer uh, these questions uh, regarding best practices for the Center of Excellence in our organization. Um, the Center of Excellence is fairly new at the Red Cross, so it is evolving in maturity. Um, so as of now, sort of how do our uh, top performers consider, continue to be successful? There are things that definitely help them be successful. Um, one is ensuring clarity on project deliverables. Um, having that ongoing clarity is very important, especially right from the beginning. They also need to be very open to good communication. Um, there are and will always be miscommunication. So being open to feedback, feedback being a, um, a good communicator will really help in uh, helping them uh, be successful. Resolving blockers very quickly as well, not leaving themselves stuck waiting. Um, ensure that the expectations of them are clear and that they can meet them. If they cannot, then they reach out for support and guidance if they need it. And um, I think another important one is that they also are open to professional feedback. I think as uh, BAs, BSAs, I don't think we'll live long enough to know everything about everything. So we need to uh, rely on each other's experiences. We all come in my organization, we all come from different backgrounds. We all have different levels of experience and expertise in different areas. And um, we need to be open and they all are on my team, very open to professional feedback. So I would say that's probably how they continue to be successful. Uh, in terms of how uh, success is repeated, 
Um, I would say by taking active, a very proactive BSA role on a project, rather than sitting back and waiting, you know, saying, okay, what is my role on this project or what are my deliverables coming with a good mindset and a good idea of the type of project you're being asked to work on and what types of deliverables are required on that project. They're not all the same. We have operational initiatives and we have capital projects and the VA work on both of those is not going to be the same. So um, that is very helpful. Um, repeating success while well, having best practices and uh, standards is definitely a way that helps us uh, repeat success. We also do uh, some peer sharing and learning with other uh, team members. So once a month I have someone on the team, I put them on the hot seat uh, in an area that they are strong in and they do a demo or a Q&A with the rest of the team to try to uh, share uh, lessons learned they have from their projects or different deliverables that they've developed some expertise in. Um, and we record those, we store them in a repertoire that's available to our team so that in, if, for example, a team member is not normally, has never done a specific model, for instance, they can go to that video and they can get a good head start on uh, some, um, to get some knowledge on how to actually even get started with that. And once they've watched the video and the accompanying documentation, if there's any, then they can reach out to the person who actually prepared that information, uh, but they're not starting from ground zero. So that is also very helpful. And another thing is lessons learned is extremely important. Um, capital projects, although they're not identical, there is a lot of similarity. So we can learn from one another, uh, much the same way as on our operational side. Everything is not identical either, but we do pick up the lessons learned from each of those individual smaller initiatives and we uh, become better. It's all about slowly becoming better. Um, in terms of frequent challenges, I would say probably miscommunication is probably one of the greatest ones. It's a challenge, uh, lack of information, timely, so sometimes they're scrambling for information and it, which can delay or hinder their work. Um, often it can be SME availability. SMEs have a full-time job. So when you're working on a project, even if it's to improve something for them, they have to somehow juggle, you know, helping the BA while at the same time uh, still doing their work. So we have to be understanding about that, but it does it does cause some challenges in terms of trying to move work forward. Um, the big picture is not always clear to the BA. Uh, sometimes there's shifting or changing and we don't always know. Uh, sometimes it only comes a little bit later. Uh, so the scope is not necessarily always clear. And another uh, frequent challenge is attaining timely approvals. Sometimes, again, because people are doing a lot of different jobs, um, if we're required to have an approval on a particular deliverable, it can be delayed uh, because they, the people we're looking for have you know, a million other things going on. So those are some of the main challenges of uh, the folks on my team. Um, and is there value in adding a process analyst to the team? So on my team, I can be anywhere between 10 and 15, let's say. Uh, recently, up until now, I've only had uh, BSAs on my team. But recently, uh, since May, I've added uh, process uh, analysts to the team. And most definitely, there is value in adding process analysts to the team. They have a completely different view of processes this is their specialty. Um, and yes, BSAs do have uh, some extensive uh, training in process analysis. But as a process analysis, at least the ones in our uh, organization, they're really helping establish framework for also process analysis. They see the full picture. There's some governance going on. There's libraries of uh, process processes that need to be 
uh, sort of standardized across the organization. So there, uh, the, the other thing as well that has recently started is we've been sending, each of us on our team have been sending the process analysts our own process mapping that we've done for feedback. And the feedback they provided to us has been invaluable in just shaping our own individual work. Um, so most definitely there is a lot of value to having a specialized process analyst on my team. Um, and then finally, in terms of common roadblock, roadblocks, they're very similar to the challenges. Um, and I would say probably the main one that is an actual block is the unavailability of SMEs uh, when they are needed. That definitely can be the biggest roadblock uh, that can cause things to be at a standstill. So. Would you like me to move to the next slide? Yeah, please. Okay. Thank right. you. Okay. So in terms of tools and templates, a large part of standardization in the Center of Excellence, um, as was mentioned, is it is a more formalized approach. So um, we do tend to use and uh, use templates. Uh, and we are, this is a, an evolving uh, repertoire of templates, but we do have many and we do provide them to, or I do provide them to the uh, folks on our team. Um, this really helps in a lot of ways. And it also helps uh, like on the projects that they're in, um, you know, the PMs on the receiving side, they are, you know, they come to expect these things from us. They come to, you know, understand where they're going to find the information. They come to see that, you know, the BSAs have had exposure to similar types of deliverables and similar types of templates. And it really does help in, uh, establishing that level of formality within the organization. It also helps when you're looking for gaps. So if I'm reviewing different templates, if they all look different, it's very hard to see if something's missing. But if they're using the same template, it's very easy to do a review of a deliverable. And you know, if something's missing, it's going to be blatantly obvious versus everybody sort of using their own type of um, material. Um, and then which templates uh, will make work faster to start and help produce consistent results. So in our, in my organization, I would say probably the most used template is probably, um, well, there's a few of them. Uh, BRD is one, just a standard BRD for our organization for some of our larger projects. Uh, requirements traceability matrix is also extremely valuable. Um, so we also have one of those in our toolkit. Process maps, um, we've established guidelines as to what we want on our maps so that they can be um, used across the organization. And when you're moving from one area to the other, you're not having to relearn all about what the maps are going to look like and what the symbols mean and so forth. So that's also been very helpful. Uh, roles and permissions matrix. Ecosystem map is also extremely important. Um, sister, system interface table. And another one that's really used on a lot of the operational initiatives is uh, a comparative analysis. We have you know, a template for that, which comes in very handy on these smaller um, initiatives when you're evaluating one uh, vendor against another on a smaller scale than something like an RFP. So those are sort of the main templates that we use in the, at CRC. And off to you, Scott. Deb, any uh, favorite templates you use in your organization that you want to call out? We, um... There's one that we, when it comes to the requirements, you were saying the requirements traceability matrix. Yeah, we, when we do RFP, we really need to actually work on that. I have a few um, kind of, I think, techniques that I would like to see uh, followed a little bit more thoroughly at, at Best Buy. Um, but the, the, the RFP process is one that I would like to see sort of built out um, with, um, for, to improve our product selection process. 
Um, I have a nice template that I like to use. It's just a question of getting it to be consistently used across our, our organization so that we're choosing right. better products. Yeah. 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 The image that you're seeing on the left here is the requirements template that I've got for my team. Um, I, I've got one other team member in my, my group. So this is something we use and it's, it's mainly for starting the conversation. Um, what I find is that because we do a variety of different things, the template's there to provide the structure, but we often tailor it. Um, so in a small organization, that's acceptable. In a large organization, that might not be acceptable. Um, as you said, Danielle, um, consistency can be important when you're working across groups. So you really have to decide when you're setting this up um, how formal, uh, how rigid, or how flexible you want this to be. Um, there's no right or wrong. It really is depending on how the group works, how the organization works as well. So um, I'm going to move on to the next slide here about learning and professional development. Um, so the question about where are your resources lacking their knowledge and experience, this can be difficult for a manager to assess. Um, in my last team, I had seven people and the answer for where each person was lacking in their knowledge experience was different for every single person. Um, so it's hard just to, to paint a large group with a broad brush, um, but you might have some knowledge gaps that you can see across the board that you want to get everyone to the same level. Um, experience uh, requires a little bit more work in terms of knowing the individuals on your team. Um, the best ways to fill those gaps. So people typically think formal training um, and that's great for people that need to know a certain area. So such as process design, you want a process design course. Um, but beyond that, you might get into some self-directed learning. Um, and I just want those that are IIBA members to be aware if you're not already, there is an online digital library of over 11,000 publications and it's free for members. Um, so in here, you'll find uh, a ton of different books. Um, there's an email you can sign up for once a week of what's new, um, lots of different reports, some audiobooks, um, some summaries of books, uh, so useful resource. Um, in my experience as a BA manager, I've managed three teams now, pairing resources up in projects is a really powerful tool. Um, that junior person working with a senior person, that's the richest uh, environment, in my opinion, you can have for that junior resource. Um, so consider that when you're thinking about training for your, your groups um, and studying for certification. Um, I'm CBAP certified and I had 10 years of experience before I started studying for the certification. And I thought I had lots of experience to go on, but I learned a few new things. I learned about traceability I had never been exposed to in my career. Um, so traceability was something that was new for me. And actually I applied to the project I was working on at the time, leading five other BAs, um, a huge project. Um, so search studying for certification is also one of those things that can also lead to some learning opportunities. Um, there's also uh, something for IIBA uh, members and that's the career action guide. Um, it, this is uh, new recently. If you haven't discovered this yet as a manager, uh, there's a subcomponent in there called a self-assessment tool, and it's a quiz of sorts. So your BAs take the self-assessment, they end up with a score, and it shows them where they're stronger, where they're weaker in terms of their skills. A great tool. Um, I went through it for the first time um, with my BA uh, last year. Both of us did it um, to understand where we wanted to invest in our careers. So highly recommend that if you haven't discovered that yet. Um, Sama, you've got another poll for us. Um, if you've got that ready, do you want to introduce that and have people vote on that? Yep, just launched it. Um, please go ahead and vote. So while we're waiting on the results there, Deb, I think you had mentioned that there's time set aside in your organization for ongoing learning. Is that right? Yes, uh, so um, at, at Best Buy, we have um, eight hours a month um, is set out to for learning, specifically for free learning, whatever you, you want. Uh, and um, it, we have 15 COPs and uh, to represent different di disciplines, we technically could have like 41. Uh, we have, uh, uh, but 15 currently established. And uh, each group is allotted that much to to cultivate their team. Okay, 
So the results the poll are in, um, it looks like 40% have an hour um, per month, uh, and then 35% three hours. We've got about 25% that are more than five hours. So pretty generous in terms of uh, time for learning. Okay. Great. Thank you everyone for participating in that. Um, the next slide, uh, I just want to let you know that there is a group in LinkedIn called Business Analysis Leaders. And if you'd like to con continue a conversation like this with peers um, at the, the management level, leadership level, um, you can join this group. And Sema has a link. She's going to drop it in the chat now. Um, it's difficult to search for some reason in LinkedIn, but if you follow the link that Sema is putting in the chat, um, you'll be able to get to that group. Um, there is a rule on the group. You need to be a manager um, in order to be accepted into the group. So if you're not a manager or team leader in your um, bio in LinkedIn, um, you unfortunately will not be able to join. So this is a peer to peer discussion intended for managers and leaders. And I'll just remind you as well, um, if you do have questions, please put them in the Q&A. Um, I see there's lots of activity in the chat. Um, but the Q&A is what we're going to use to answer questions. And we'll get to that shortly. Um, we've got one more section that we're going to go through. And I'll pass it over to Deb. Thanks, Scott. Um, so uh, amazing chat on learning and development. And I'm so excited to see that so many people have uh, that, uh, that time in their organizations uh, to do that. Um, COPs. Um, is definitely um, an area that cultivates learning. Um, I would say COPs are the, the social fabric of learning and that collective learning is um, the kind of the, the result uh, of it is best practices. So I don't know if you've read this book, this is a really good book, a um, little dry, but a, little, a really good book on community of practices by Etienne Wagner. If you've not read it, it's, it's a good resource. Um, and as I was saying, um, yeah, that's why we have uh, 15 COPs. Uh, we have eight hours a, uh, a month um, to cultivate our craft. Um, my team, uh, we've chosen to do, uh, in fact, all of Ecom uh, has uh, a learning day <laughs> where we do a, a full learning day um, and uh, as a group and can study whatever we were interested in to uh, cultivate our domain. Um, and in addition to that, I reserve three hours for peer reviews, which is, yeah, peer reviews is a discussion on this slide. Uh, so um, the way we've, we've uh, constructed it is uh, we have, we, we're agile, so we work in two week sprints. And so we have a peer review um, in the second week of the sprint. So we have an hour and a half where the team will meet and, um, and it's, we do, we set it at that time uh, in the second week of the sprint because we want to have an opportunity before we do our sprint review with our business and show them what we did to show it first to our team, um, our BA team, and, um, be and also before we release. So we do it at that time for those two reasons because it's an opportunity for us to improve what we've been working on, what we thought was so great. Maybe, maybe we could do it better. Um, and so uh, we, we have our peer reviews at that time. And the goals in the format of the peer review is that um, the way we operate is that each BA has in their wiki a curated space where the, the operational readiness for BA work is stored. And um, each BA in a peer review um, shows their work that they're working on in the sprint. Um, others, um, other BAs in, in the peer review will um, show, uh, will we'll, we'll share how they did something perhaps similar, but maybe a little bit different or how, how they handled something. And um, that, that kind of sparks the conversation in the room. And we have an opportunity for group feedback. Now, so think about that, group feedback. So learning to give and receive feedback in a safe place, uh, in a constructive way, is an incredible life skill. A lot of people take that personally. It's a great thing to cultivate. Um, it's also an opportunity to socialize existing templates and standards um, that we're starting to build out more and more so that 
to speak to Danielle's point that she made before for that consistency, that best of breed, like look and feel so that things are easier to find and, um, and we know what, what good looks like. Um, it's also a creative springboard uh, for the group to improve upon the templates that already exist. Maybe there's something we missed. Maybe there's something we could do better. And um, best practices in this environment of peer review are grown organically through that feedback loop. And um, it's an, also an opportunity to cross train um, the BAs in the community um, on other products that other teams are managing, or other products, we call them products, products or systems, uh, that, that other teams, BAs are managing, we get sort of a, a, an insight into what are those products and what they're working on. And so if you ever get placed in that family, you kind of learn a little bit about what's going on in that space. So it's good for cross training. And um, it's also an opportunity to build that team spirit um, and increase the confidence uh, that each BA has in the deliverables that they're presenting in a few days to their business teams and their team. So, um, and then the unintended result is, um, is this wonderful social benefit uh, of interaction uh, where in a, a time where we're all work from home, there's a lot of mental health issues. So this is really great team experience and um, just a wonderful social benefit. And our team has also, um, we've just, we've dug into some really amazing uh, top lit topics like um, I was mentioning before about wanting to create RFP templates and, um, you know, have this proper scoring so that we choose the right tool. Um, the, um, we've also looked at, you know, business process improvement and using tools like liberating structures to um, make that better. Um, process mapping techniques. Uh, we always used Visio, but now we're kind of moving into the Miro space because it's more collaborative with the business. So things that we're, we're really working through and um, that we've discovered in peer review. Um, and there's still a lot of opportunity in that for continuous improvement, like refining those templates, um, perhaps even creating a rubric for assessing um, peer reviews so that it's a little bit more standardized. And any other amazing ideas that my wonderful VA team can come up with because I will tell you that uh, it is absolutely a community and every single member of that community brings value. Um, the idea of having this show and tell peer review came to me recently from a new BA, um, hadn't had just joined the company, hadn't been a BA for very long. So every single person brings value and has wonderful ideas and should not be underestimated because they don't have uh, senior BA um, status or whatnot, because that's not true. Everyone brings that value. And so now um, I'm going to uh, to pass it over to Sema for the Q&A. Thanks, Deb. Thanks, uh, Danielle and Scott. That was all very amazing information. We have a ton of questions um, in our Q&A box. So I'm gonna uh, jump right into it. Um, if you have any questions, um, comments, or specific ch challenges, put um, them in the questions tab now through them. So first up, our first question, can a COP help to transform the organization to agile? Um, um, Danielle, do, since you, you manage a COP, uh, what are your thoughts on Actually, you're cutting in and out, but I, if it's COP, I think it's uh, probably a question for Deb, I think. Oh, my apologies. Nope, um, in, okay. case you didn't, in case you didn't get the full question, I'll, I'll repeat it. Can a COP help to transform the organization? Did you get that, Deb? A COP help to transform the organization? An organization to agile. Um, I don't, I think that uh, we had us, we had brought on like specific people who met our community of practice for, for the scrum community and that team uh, steered our agile journey. We brought in experts who, um, who knew scrum, who knew agile and they transformed our organization. I think um, having COPs 
uh, does support because um, the, the, there's a chance for us to really understand our domain, our, what our, what's our career framework, what's our purpose domain and account accountabilities, and to build out what we do and how we fit in, a, in an agile team. Um, we're constantly validating that our purpose domains and accountabilities don't overlap too much. Um, and, and, and we do that work as, as leaders of a domain or a discipline. So I can see that there's, there's benefit from it, but we actually did bring in resources to help educate the whole of technology and e-com on our agile journey. All right, that sounds good. And um, um, further to that question, how do you generate support and buy-in to, to get it started, both from uh, leadership for, uh, from leadership and the BA team perspective? Yeah, that's a, a good question. Um, I think from, from my perspective, uh, setting up a COE for the first time in an organization and running it, um, it really comes down to um, being able to articulate needs. So for example, I went into an organization that had no standards, no best practices. Everyone was doing literally their own thing. Um, was able to demonstrate to the leadership that, you know what, if we had consistency, we would get better results. Um, if you can figure out what's successful and repeat that success through processes and templates and, and that type of thing, then what you're dealing with is something that um, really helps the management understand there's an importance there. Um, so that's my experience in terms of setting one up and getting the buy-in. I'm not sure, um, Danielle or Deb, if you have different experience. Um, I inherited mine, so I, I don't know. I, I do know that we, we did set up uh, COPs for, um, for all the core um, disciplines uh, at Best Buy, uh, but um, we did so to, to encourage the development of the teams, uh, uh, of the development of that discipline and clarity in the, within the teams. Um, how we got buy-in from leadership was uh, the Scrum Master community because they were our first community of practice and we have an amazing um, practice lead for that community and he advocated for, for our communities of practice. He is our champion. Okay. From, uh, sorry, you want to say something, Danielle? I was just going to say um, that I also inherited as well and uh, so buy-in was already uh, had already taken place and um, the maturity of the center of excellence had already uh, evolved when I came on. So leadership was already on board. Okay. From a, a BA uh, buy-in perspective, personally, I didn't see any challenges. Um, I found that the BAs were very supportive as long as they're involved. Um, if it's a top-down approach and it's dictated, this is what you're going to do, um, you're probably going to get resistance because BAs are very smart, independent thinkers. Um, if they're engaged in help forming those groups and running those groups, um, you're going to have a higher rate of success, in my opinion. And, and to add to that, um, if you need support and, and getting a buy-in, actually our team at IIBA, the corporate program team, they do have some resources and they can help help. Um, um, in, in, um, in helping you get buy-in. So I'll, I'll enter the email in the chat and also uh, enter an, a link there. If you're looking for support and getting buy-in, please feel free to reach out. Um, we're here to help. Um, next question um, is um, when we were on the template, there's a slew of questions coming in all about templates um, uh, and how do you get started in the first place with templates? <laughs> I was going to say again, um, your internet is cutting out, at least for me. So uh, I caught part of what you were saying. Oh, I'm so sorry. My apologies. I'll repeat the question. Where do you get templates and how do you get it with templates? Um, again, in my case, um, Center of Excellence had already 
uh, been established by the time I got here. So there was a bank of templates that were uh, already uh, approved and in place. Um, and so it's a matter of evolving and adding new ones in our case at this point. And they just sort of organically uh, happen mm -hmm. when you're starting to see that, you know, across similar projects, people are using very different things, um, which is what I was mentioning earlier in terms of, you know, you start realizing that if you're going to be providing feedback and evaluating, uh, you know, different deliverables, it's very helpful if they are very similar versus, um, you know, uh, every BA doing what they came with, right? So you start recognizing the benefit of providing a similar uh, format and template for everyone to use. And uh, much like Scott said, you know, getting feedback and buy-in from those who are using it is critical. I don't have all the answers. So I have very smart people on my team. So I might come up with some kind of framework. Um, I also get input from those above me um, and also from my team. So it's a very collaborative effort, uh, regardless of who I, whose idea it is. If it's a good idea and it helps make our work better, um, then it's worth considering uh, implementing that template into our work. Yeah, I agree. Those things uh, tend to happen organically in, in RCOP. So, I mean, I like really much what you were saying, Danielle, about, you know, everybody brings what they know from the different um, positions they've had, templates they may have used elsewhere. Um, but in a COP, a world where there's a COP, whatever you, there, there may be an existing template, you may want to have that freedom to improve upon it and make recommendations with within the COP during the peer review and in showing that there's a new way or some additional things. Hey, I thought it would be great if we added this in and it allows it to grow um, naturally, organically um, to improve what already exists um, and have that elastic mind to say, yeah, hey, that's great. Let's, is that what, and everybody's there and it works for the community. Sounds good. Thank you, guys. Um, another question from our audience, um, from Kimberly. I have found that the hybrid methodology can be very problematical in planning. <laughs> if one person is working in a waterfall mindset, UX, for example, and the devs are working in agile and looking for epics, it's hard to move forward in any efficient type of plan. In this case, it seems a COP would not be very efficient either. Thoughts on this? Well, I, I, I've only seen Wagile where it's, we're doing waterfall, but we're gonna do standups um, or <laughs> we're, doing, we're, we're doing waterfall, but um, we have this one process of, of discovery that we need to do and we need to engage all these businesses. So we're gonna do a Kanban board just to get through that work and pull in that work. And it's just for that little part of the initiative. Um, for the most part, it really wasn't, it was waterfall. Um, I've not worked in a true hybrid. Where I am is is hardcore agile, so I can't really speak beyond that uh, limited knowledge of agile. Yeah, I'll just add in. Um, I haven't experienced that before, but it sounds like you've got two different two groups working at different using different methodologies. And what it sounds like is you need some organizational alignment to bring those together. Um, there's only going to be continued frustration by those groups working in different ways. Um, so there needs to be a higher level conversation about how do you bring those together so those groups can work uh, cohesively together. I can add as well a little bit on that in terms of uh, from our organization. So the larger transformational projects would be quite challenging to uh, do uh, using an agile methodology. There's just too much money involved. These projects are massive. They're enterprise wide. There's integration with other systems. So it can start off waterfall where there is a lot of planning. There is a lot of effort put up front, but it can later then be broken down into a more iterative approach where we're taking pieces of that giant puzzle and then 
working those in a more agile type fashion. So in the in that sense, we're sort of doing this hybrid. Um, I I we do have some uh, projects that are uh, exclusively agile, but as I said, the larger transformational enterprise wide ones, um, not so much. Oh, fantastic. Thank you for that. Um, next question by Christopher, how would you recommend managing the transformation between business requirements to design documentation being created by IT and the analysts? Do you want me to repeat the question? Um, I'm thinking about how to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> I'd almost want to ask a follow-up question, but knowing we can't do that, um, that's a challenging one to answer. Um, we can we can maybe dive into that one in the in the group um, in the BA leaders group uh, if if we need a follow-up on, on that, Scott. Um, so we'll leave that one, uh, Christopher, and um, um, we can either answer you. Uh, via email or through the BA leader group um, if you join there. Um, next question um, was is from Bonnie. It's a little bit related or kind of a follow up to the one that we just answered. Any suggestions for using center of um, a COP to help BAs transition from waterfall to agile or bring the two groups together? And how to do that? I'm not sure, Deb. I know you, you're sort of the agile specialist. Yeah, maybe you could repeat it because I started to answer that transformation question in the chat, which I probably shouldn't know because I didn't hear your question. <laughs> sure. Um, any suggestions for using um, a COP to help BAs transition from waterfall to agile or bring the two together or the two groups together? Um, well, like I said, again, I, I, I've worked waterfall and I've worked agile, haven't really worked in the transition uh, stage, but I would say that um, the transition, because the deliverables are, and the way you approach the work and the scope is so different, um, the transition is really in those pieces, is in, is in the framework, so you're not doing, following um, a traditional waterfall development um, life cycle, you're actually following two week sprints. So there's no way that you would go out and gather all the requirements. And the, so the, the effort that you need to, to, to apply as a BA is, is, is um, kind of curtailed to the time that you have. So you only have like two weeks and it's only on a specific area of work. So the templates you use um, and the, the amount of work that you're expected to produce and have it be usable at the end of that two weeks will curtail the approach that you take and the templates and everything will, will fall in line. So the transformation itself is, is driven by a scrum framework, if that makes sense. Like you, you can't go and grab an end to end requirements. You can't do all of the process flows for the entire thing. You just don't have the time. Yeah. And it's not the focus that the PM told you to focus on. All right. Thank you for that, Deb. Thank you. Um, now, a little bit of a change of topic. There's a lot of love for peer re for the peer review concept um, and uh, a few questions here with regards to that. So I'm going to dive into those ones. How can, uh, uh, how can I mentor uh, a junior BA or junior BAs using reviews and hands-on training, but avoiding micromanagement at the same time? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, when I talk to other BA managers, um, uh, often the theme comes up about how much attention, how much direction do you give your BA resources? And, and the general rule of thumb that I suggest is your senior resources are going to want to be managed more uh, from an empowerment perspective. Um, they've got years of experience, they've got expertise, um, give them a little bit of direction and let them run with it. Um, whereas your junior resources, let's just say someone is six months into doing business analysis, um, you're going to need to meet with them more frequently. 
um, they're gonna have smaller pieces of work. Um, they're, the conversations that you have with them, maybe you're meeting with them once a week, maybe twice a week. Um, the conversations you have, you're gonna be sharing some of your knowledge as you go through and coach them. Okay, here's the next assignment I want you to get to, I want you to put together a process diagram for the simple function here. Um, it's gonna be more instructional, um, but I wouldn't, wouldn't say micromanage. Um, I don't like that term um, and I don't manage that way myself. Um, what I do is I give the resource a challenge, something that's gonna stretch their skills a little bit and then monitor their progress and tell them, hey, open door, come and see me, you got questions, that type of thing and deal with it more from allowing them to experiencing it. So giving them enough rope to learn, but not giving them enough rope to hang themselves, that, that type of saying. Um, that, that freedom, that ability to learn things is important, but um, it's a real art. It's, it's not a science. It's an art of management of how to go about doing that. Um, we could probably do a whole webinar just on that one topic. <laughs> And um, yeah, go ahead, uh, Danielle, sorry. Um, I was going to add uh, a little bit about that as well. Absolutely. So I think some of it depends on the formality of the center. So if you're running, you know, if you're managing a center of excellence, there's going to be expected more formality than um, the CLP as we suggested. So there is an expectation already that you are going to be following a format. You're gonna be, there will be templates provided. So providing feedback on an existing framework template is easier when there's a template there. It's a lot, you know, maybe more personal if you have 10 people with 10 different ways of doing things. But if you have something within uh, that's fairly formal already, then you're really just evaluating the content. Um, so it's a little bit less micromanaging, I think, when there's a bit more formality structure already in place. It's like, this is the way we do business. And um, you can, I mean, there is always going to be some styling and some content that will differ, but it does help uh, with some of that micromanaging, I think, when the expectation is already set that we do this this way. Mm. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, that sounds good, yeah. And um, I just did a quick time check. Um, we've, been so, we've been having so much fun with this, uh, all of this great information. And we are almost at the end of our webinar. And unfortunately, with two minutes left, that is all the questions we're gonna be taking today. That is all the time we have. Uh, please um, join the LinkedIn group to continue the conversation there. We will um, to pull some of the questions um, that we didn't get to from this webinar and answer them um, over there. And, and uh, we may also reach out to uh, via email to individually address some of your questions. So with that, um, that's all the time we have. Thank you so much for joining us. And I just wanna do a quick wrap up um, uh, and, and with some commentary on the great information that were shared here by Scott, Deb and Danielle. If you've been ignoring standardization, it's time to obviously play, pay closer attention and um, a, a BACOE or BACOP provides the framework to standardize and is essential um, in increasing the business analysis capability maturity level um, um, in your organization and consequently in reducing the risk of projects. As well, uh, it would help with increasing project success rate, stabilize skills and optimize productivity. And this is where IBS corporate program can help as it provides the resources to support you uh, um, in, along your organization's business analysis practice maturity journey. The support and resources provided through the program um, can help enable the business analysis community of an organization to have a common standard of practice through enterprise access to IBA standards, tools, and templates, um, set benchmarks, align competencies to roles and mandates with IABA's assessment methodology for business analysis resource training and development, um, augment business analysis capabilities with access to standards and best practices in specialized domains such as agile analysis, cybersecurity analysis, business data analytics, and product ownership analysis, 
And uh, build um, additional resources include building relationships and growing your network by engaging with IVA global chapters and corporate members through corporate leader webinars and discussions. And you also get exclusive research reports uh, that can provide a lens into the future of business analysis and as also quarterly corporate benchmarking surveys giving you insight on how your organization measures up against other um, corporates. So with that, thank you for, for joining us and for all your questions. If you have further questions, um, visit um, further questions about the, uh, the corporate program and how it can support your organization, visit iba.org forward slash corporate or reach out via corporate membership at iba.org. Good luck to all of you in your business analysis maturity journeys. Bye everyone. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.